Hello and welcome to Model Aviation Live. I'm your host, Jay Smith, executive editor of Model Aviation and Park Pilot magazines. And I wanted to talk to you about a couple of things before I bring our guests out. One of the things that I want to share with you is some unfortunate news that I received this morning. So if you're familiar with scale RC helicopters, uh, one of the most notable people involved in that hobby, Lynn Mount, uh, sadly has passed. If you're not familiar with Lynn, I have a quick bio here. He achieved 21 national championship titles with RC helicopters. He also built and flew helicopters in two James Bond films, uh, Golden Eye and The World Is Not Enough. And he also was involved in George Orwell's 1984. In, I think, uh, 2011, uh, a book came out called A Bit of a Challenge, The Life and Times of a pioneer in the world of radio controlled helicopters. And that was written by Lynn Mount and also Michael Coveney. Both of them, Lynn and Michael, came to the Nats the first year I worked at AMA. So 15 years ago in 2008, uh, I got to meet them and I was fascinated because I knew a little bit about Lynn and I was fascinated to talk to him and see his helicopter. And they were both were just so uh, nice and uh, they even invited me to dinner. So that first night uh, at the Nats, after I met them, I had dinner with them and uh, I later got to review the book when it came out. So I was really saddened to hear this morning that he passed away on the evening of the 14th. So we're going to have an article in the magazine in the future, and it's actually going to be written by Michael, which was one of his closest friends. So very sad that uh, Lynn is no longer with us, but we will definitely share a lot more of his story in the magazine. The other thing I was going to mention is about three weeks ago, I actually got to take a vacation, which is sometimes difficult when you're responsible for a magazine, a monthly magazine. And I went to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which I'd never been there before. And um, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, if you don't know, is the birthplace of TSR, which is the parent company that released Dungeons and Dragons. It was created there. Um, not that we want to go into a long story about Dungeons and Dragons. It's more about uh, a game that is called Dawn Patrol that was created around 1968. And a gentleman named Mike Carr created it. Basically a board game, uh, World War I combat, uh, uses uh, a playing field with hexes on it and cardboard aircraft and you roll dice. And so I had the opportunity while I was in Lake Geneva to play the game with Mike Carr and a few other people. So, it was an amazing experience because to me it would be almost like you know the creator of monopoly saying hey would you like to play the game i created with me so for me it was really exciting to uh, to meet mike and to play the game we played for about three and a half hours and uh i did really well and survived the the uh, whole aerial combat and came very close to shooting down one of the enemy enemy aircraft you know played by or or um piloted by one of the other players so that was a really neat experience. Another interesting thing really quick is that game has been played at every Gen Con. And Gen Con is the longest running tabletop gaming convention uh, in, in the U.S., in the biggest. And it was created by Gary Gygax, co-creator of Dungeons & Dragons and founder of TSR. He started it, the first one was at his house, and then it went to the Horticultural Hall in Lake Geneva. I got to see that as well. But interestingly, Dawn Patrol has been played at every Gen Con for, I think this year, it'll be 57 years. So Mike ran it at Gary's house, the first Gen Con, and then at Horticultural Hall, and everywhere it's been afterwards. It's now held here in, in Indiana, in Indianapolis. It takes up the entire convention center in Indianapolis, plus it takes up Lucas Oil Stadium, where the Colts play. It's that big. I mean, our convention center here is huge, and it takes up the whole football field as well. So Mike will be coming this year and and uh, running games uh, of Dawn Patrol. So just thought it was a neat neat story to share. Obviously, it doesn't involve RC, but it does involve aviation. And currently, if you're interested in looking into the game, you can buy copies on eBay. It's not currently in print. However, Mike is working on a revised edition which will probably be the last edition that that he um, releases 
But uh, just a little bit of insight on uh, the last uh, few weeks and an interesting opportunity. And I also, when we played the game, we actually played it in the uh, Geneva Lake Museum. So they actually opened the museum. They were closed and they opened the museum the day I was there to allow us to play the game. And that museum is a really neat museum with a lot of local history. And they're working on an exhibit for Gary Gygax because next year is the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. So the exhibit is going to be called uh, The Wizard of Lake Geneva. And I actually got to see it, even though it's not open yet. So a big shout out, a big thank you to the Geneva Lake Museum and Mike Carr and all the people. There was nine of us that played the game. Okay, so obviously I'm excited to get our guests on today. We've got a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about the July issue and the Battle of Britain movie and the models that were used in the movie. So let's bring out our guests. I'm very excited to share... Um, today's show with Derek and Pat. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How you doing? Good. Great. Happy to be here and talk about Battle of the Britain, the movie, and, and you know, obviously even the the actual event in history. Um, and I, I wanted to start off, since we're going to talk about the models that were used in the film, and then we're going to talk about the models that you two gentlemen designed. I wanted to ask both of you about your first time seeing the movie. Was it in the theater? Was it on video? Was it streaming? And, you know, what were your thoughts when you saw the movie? Well, the first time I saw it, I think it was on TCM, if I'm not mistaken. It's been quite a while ago, and I haven't seen it in quite some time. Did you enjoy it? I sure did. <laughs> Anything that involves airplanes, I, that's my kind of thing. Absolutely. What about you, Derek? I, I think it might even been Turner Classic Movies as well. It was on some sort of uh, late night um, programming, and, and we were talking off the air about recording things, and I actually had recorded it off of uh, off of TV, so there was commercials in it, but I'd fast forward as a kid and watch all the aviation scenes and it got to the, to the point where I actually know some of the German lines in the movie. I've seen it so many times. <laughs> I don't speak fluent German, so it's kind of all just from memorization and, and watching it so many times. Well, I, you know, I think, um, you know, as Pat said, it's, it's the whole, that, the Battle of Britain, that conflict was all, you know, fought in the air. And so for those that are interested in aviation, and of course a movie about the event is there's just so much, um, aviation portrayed in the movie, but it's interesting, and, and I talk about this in the article, that the filmmakers did not want people to know when they went and saw the movie. They didn't want them to know that RC models were used, and because of that, sadly, the four people who built the models were not given any credit, you know, at the end of the film in the credits. Um, there was no promotional photos of them ever released. I mean, it was just, you know, they tried to keep it under wraps, and so you know, I like both of you. I probably saw it on Turner Classic Movies because I'm, per, I'm personally wasn't born yet when the movie came out. So, um, you know, obviously I saw it later. I didn't see it in the theater, but I will say that um, when I was interviewing about the movie and uh, you know talking about the models that were being made for the movie, um, the suggestion was that maybe the movie needed some kind of narration. And, you know, and I'm sure uh, different people will feel differently, but that's what Dave Platt told me. He said he, he Dave actually saw the movie in the movie theater and he liked it, but he thought it needed narration to kind of help people that weren't familiar with the history to kind of take them through, um, you know, what's portrayed in the movie. But uh, obviously, Dave, um, as I mentioned in the article and, and for those that are watching, if you if you have digital, you'll you'll have had access as of today to see all the articles and see the issue, the, the July issue. And if you get print, you won't have it quite yet, but uh, it'll be about a week to 10 days. But in the article where I interviewed Dave Platt and he gave us a lot of photos that he had from that period, um, you know, they were basically um, the four gentlemen that built the models. Uh, they met at, I believe it was Pinewood Studios and they, the filmmakers thought that they were going to fly tons of aircraft in formation and, you know, the, the, the expectations of what could be done were a little unrealistic. And so Dave and the other modelers had to explain what could be done. And basically they had to build three models 
Uh, there was four of them. They had to build three models and then they flew them for about a week on camera. And, you know, all this is, of course, in the article. But uh, uh, Dave shared that they were on top of a van. Uh, I believe you said a VW van and the side was cut out and that's where the camera was and the camera person. And they were on the roof holding on to like a rail and they were having to fly their airplanes while the van drove up and down the runway. They were having to fly. And I just thought that for me, that would be very disorienting to be on top of a vehicle that's moving while I'm trying to fly my airplane. I, obviously, I've never tried it, but I, I would think that would be very disorienting. But uh, Dave felt it wasn't too difficult. And uh, every day they would film and then they'd go watch in a small theater. And then they would go back out and they'd ask them to do different things. And then they'd go back and watch. And after about a week, uh, they decided that it would work. And mainly they wanted the RC models for the flight sequences with the Stukas because there was no flyable Stukas available uh, to use in the film. They did have one that came out of a museum that was non-flyable, and that was the one that um, Dave Platt was asked to model his after. So Dave created the Stuka uh, at one six scale, and the other two gentlemen created the other two aircraft. And basically, you know, that then was those the designs that they created from three views uh, were what was used to build a many more models in the film. Um, and sadly, Dave did not um, continue to work with them once they started actually working on the film itself because he actually uh, accepted a job uh, to come to the U.S. and work for Top Flight models. So he had to leave the project. And he told me that this project that he worked on for about six, seven weeks building the models and testing them for the film was the best job he's ever had in his life. He absolutely loved it. It was the biggest, the Stuka was the biggest aircraft he'd ever built to that point. And they gave him all the gear to use, you know, the radios and the engines and all the gear was provided to them and everything that they needed was provided to them. So I had heard this story from Dave a couple of times. Uh, one time was out in Colorado at a Warbird event. And then I think in Florida, it might've been at the King Orange. He talked a little bit about it. And I thought, you know, we really need to share this story. And I think it's been shared a couple of other times. I know there's a website dedicated to it, but I just felt the urge to share the story because unfortunately, Dave's the only one left. The other three gentlemen have, have passed away. And so uh, Dave was very gracious to allow me to interview him. And he gave us all these photos that you see. And all of these were actual prints that he got back in 67. So, you know, this wasn't digital. He sent me all of his original photos and we scanned them in. And then there was the one color photo that she used as the lead photo. And I'm not sure that color photo has ever been published. So uh, we were really excited to, to share this story. And so when the story came together, so that color photo there, obviously, as you look at the screen, that's Dave Platt on the far right with his Stuka and um, modeled exactly like the full scale. And uh, so when, when this came together to tell the story, I wanted to get some construction articles to go along with it because I hope when people read the article, uh, they are going to be interested in building, uh, you know, one or more models that, that are models that, flew in the Battle of Britain. So thankfully, both uh, Derek and Pat agreed to do it on about a two-month time frame, maybe-ish. And uh, so I, I kind of want to open it up to both of you. And, you know, we'll, we'll start with you, Derek. I mean, so when I reached out to you and told you about this article with Dave Platt and, you know, wanting to kind of sort of do a themed issue, you know, what were your initial thoughts, Derek? Well, I was really excited about, you know, being able to be a part of this project. So I think it's it's a neat tribute to not only the the Dave and the, the modelers that sort of really first introduced Hollywood and, and the public to RC airplanes, but just, just overall to be a part of the Battle of Britain uh, uh, experience, even in a very small way. Uh, but it was a pretty big project. Um, you know, I didn't have anything designed up at the time. So I think we spoke on a Friday and, and I started collecting some 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 three views and some data uh, that evening and started drawing on that following Saturday and um, I it, it was a lot of long hours you know finish work and then jump right on the other computer and start drafting and working on stuff and uh, 
you know, with, uh, with the park flyers I've been doing, I also have been including the, um, the tissue templates, which in itself almost takes as long to design those as it does the model itself. So it was a pretty big um, project, but it was, it was fun. I had a lot of, uh, a lot of fun moments in it. And I think I mentioned it was exactly two months to the day when I had sent off the article uh, for, for, publish, for publication. So it was busy, but really a rewarding one. And Pat, what were your thoughts when we first talked? And uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Pat, it was your idea to do the hurricane. Well, yeah, you had mentioned that you needed something from the Battle of Britain. And, and of course, you know, I was not really all that familiar with the history. So I knew that the Spitfire was involved as well as the hurricane and figured, you know, there's so many Spitfires out there and so few hurricanes, that would probably be the best bet. And fortunately, I've always liked the hurricane. So uh, I thought, what a great opportunity to be able to do something like that and, and it be historically significant. So I got on uh, Wikipedia and discovered that I didn't really realize that the Battle of Britain was so short-lived. I think it was, what, about a six-week period or eight weeks? It didn't yeah, amount to much. Yeah, just but, a few months, yes. Yeah, and then I also discovered that the hurricane was responsible for more kills of German aircraft than any other airplane used in the Battle of Britain. So it turned out to be a really great little project to do. And uh, the Hurricane's a great airplane anyway. So I thought, you know, this is perfect opportunity. So I, I definitely do appreciate the, the chance to do something like that. So uh, let me ask you, Pat, um, how did you settle on the size of your aircraft? And obviously not everybody's seen it. So tell us a little bit about the size and how you, how you decided on the size. Well, after having dabbled in park flyers for, oh, many, many years, I've actually discovered that anywhere from 48 to 55 inches is a real nice size for a, uh, a warbird. So uh, I kind of settled in on 48 because it was easy to transport. Uh, you can use smaller uh, power systems in them and every, logistically everything is just easier to deal with. And uh, I think uh, some people will be interested to hear what size battery you're flying this 48-inch wingspan aircraft on. Believe it or not, it's just a 2202S. And it'll get flight times 12 to 15 minutes, depending on how it's flown. So obviously we're showing, uh, right now we're showing the article uh, that you wrote, Pat, and showing some pictures about building the model. So uh, tell us a little bit about what skill level, Pat, do you think someone would need to be at to tackle this? And are, is there any, you know, throughout the build, is there any challenging parts to it that you would want to mention to anybody that's considering tackling this? Well, actually, I would call it an intermediate build and, and flyer as well. Uh, I don't know that a ranked beginner would be able to do all that well unless they've got some prior experience, you know, building free flights or U controls or something like that. But it's the, the basic structure is, is just that it's basic, you know, a typical uh, keel and spine and formers and stringers and the wing is egg crate style. So it all just kind of plugs together like a puzzle. And then uh, stringers are added and uh, it's soft skin. So uh, there's no sheeting involved, so that does make it a little bit easier. And uh, what did what did you cover it with? Uh, actually, I still have a little bit of micro light left, oh. and so it was covered with um, essentially scraps of micro light and painted with Tamiya acrylics. And uh, so. What did you say the flight times you're getting on the 2200 2S? Uh, 12 to 15 minutes. Wow. And it's actually, I've flown it a couple of times with the 1300 2S, and it did just fine, but the flight times are down around seven or eight minutes. And when you know, you said intermediate um, um, flying ability. So, what are your thoughts on how it flies uh, in comparison to a lot of the other models that you build? Oh, it flies great. It flies like a pattern bird. It's. It, solid, uh, steady, 
um, very stable. And, and the only the only thing is landing is typical of a warbird. You got to get it right. You know, a little bit of a flare and, you know, keep your speed up a little bit and uh, keep the power on. And it it does just fine. Now, you had mentioned, too, if there is any tricky spots in it. And one that um, I did recall was the exhaust stacks. It's something that you just can't live without. And trying to do two mirror image exhaust stacks identically is kind of a challenge. So what I did was I carved one from basswood, made a silicone rubber mold, and cast them in uh, casting resin. So that's the only thing that was what I would call out of the ordinary of just simple basic modeling. And um, what um, did you settle on? Us, I mean, obviously it has a specific color scheme, but uh, what did you settle on, or did you research that, or how did you come up with the the color scheme you went with? Well, basically, I found uh, some images online of Battle of Britain hurricanes, and it's kind of an amalgamation of a couple of different schemes. One being the black and white bottom. I, I couldn't determine for sure if any of the uh, Battle of Britain hurricanes had that color scheme on the bottom, but the top side is uh, configured like one of them that I did find in the Battle of Britain Museum. We we got a comment from XJet. He says 3D printing could have been an option for the exhaust stack. So those that have access to a 3D printer, that would be a good option as well. Oh, absolutely. And the spinner would be also. And, and um, so you said that the only um, thing to be mindful of when you fly it is the landing. Obviously, it flies like a warbird. But, uh, you know, watching the video of fly, which I've seen previously, uh, as you said, it, it just seems to be a, a pretty gentle aircraft. Yeah, it really is. Um, the only thing, and there's, I've had two other airplanes that did that, but the elevator is extremely sensitive. It, even though the CG's a good bit more forward than what I usually do. You know, I'm, I kind of like fly airplanes a little on the tail heavy side, but, um, but even with the CG uh, conservatively forward, the elevator's kind of sensitive, so I don't know. I, I think I dialed in 15 or 20% expo, and it, it settled it right down. Well, I want to give you a chance, uh, Derek. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, seeing it fly on video, and, and do you have any questions that, for Pat about his project? No, I, I, I can concur from what we're seeing on the video here. It looks like a really nice flying model, and, and uh, you know, Pat's designs are very lightweight so the wing loading is is i'm assuming pretty light on this one as well yeah it's about eight ounces a square foot if i remember right which on a warbird is is really difficult to do so excellent excellent job on getting that such a light because it, it does you know, unless you have really heavy winds it does make for a nicer flying model and and um you can you know as a warbird you tend to have to fly them really, really fast. Otherwise you have, you know, concerns of stalling, but you wouldn't have that same con you know, concern or issue with a model like this. So it's really nice, nice looking model. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I always appreciate how light Pat builds. And I told him that, you know, most people that would be thinking about a 48 inch electric warbird would be thinking 4S in my opinion. Most people would think that's powered with a 4S battery and here, He's flying a 2S and with such a, a, a light wing loading. And so uh, how does it handle, being being a light for its size, Pat, how does it handle the wind? Uh, you got to pick your flying day. It's you know, typical of everything I do. You can't fly it in a gale. I mean, it just, we were out this morning and I flew the, um, what did I fly? I flew the Taylorcraft this morning and it's it's got about a six ounce wing loading. And by the time we got done, the wind was at about seven and starting to get real turbulent, but it was manageable. You know, it's, they're flyable, particularly for the, the guys that are used to flying in wind all the time. Right. Well, let's talk uh, a bit about the Stuka, uh, Derek, and uh, we uh, want to hear from you a little bit about how you decided on the size that you did and how you decided on the scheme that you decided on. Sure. Well, I've been doing um, a lot of the uh, 
park flyer about the 30 inch range, which is what this model is as well. And you can kind of see up my shoulder, we've got a couple other ones that are in that same size. Um, and I've been really having a lot of fun design and build those, uh, those size airplanes. So that's what kind of uh, got me on doing this particular size. The color scheme, um, I wanted to match the ones that were in the Battle of Britain. And I actually had some confusion for a while because the, the picture you've got of, of Dave holding the Stuka, it's, you know, he has a yellow nose on it and kind of the same, you know, two-tone um, German camouflage on the top. But as I researched it more, it looks as though that was um, his initial model that they built and then they built some additional Stukas for the, for the filming of the movie. So I ended up doing mine based on that. And I was able to find um, uh, a couple of different color schemes. So the one that the model, the prototype is in is a, of an actual uh, color scheme that was um, on the, the Eastern front. And I liked it because it just had some, you know, some, some flash of color with the, with the blue on the spinner and the, and the white on the, the lightning bolt. So that kind of helps with visibility. Um, but I did, um, with the, the tissue patterns that are available, I was able to do one that um, was of the squadron that was in the movie Battle of Britain. Um, there was a, a horse galloping or something like that in the shield, and I was able to find that, and that's included. And then just to sort of pay uh, homage to, to Pat, there was one that I created up, a, a faux um, lettering that has PL, the, the cross TT on, on the, on the numbering. So kind of a little bit of a nod to, 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 uh, to Dave there. So, um, but that's, that's how I ended up with the color scheme on this one. So talk us a little bit through the, the build, uh, you know, kind of like what I asked Pat, I mean, what kind of skill level would you say someone needs to be in? Is there any parts of it that you would, you would want to talk a little bit about that might be challenging to someone? Sure. So I would say, you know, some of what, what Pat was explained, it's it's an intermediate um, model. Um, it's not your not your first one like a trainer. But if you built a gallows or any other, you know, sort of stick and tissue type model like this one, you shouldn't have any difficulty with it. Um, it's it's a standard layout where you build the, the fuselage and a, and a half over a, a keel. Um, one thing that I've been doing with my models lately is in, in, when you do the keel, there's actually a stringer that connects the top and the bottom keel, and you glue the, the former half directly to that versus having a little bit of a notch in the former. It just makes it a little bit easier, I found, um, for getting all those parts to, to line up properly. Um, so that's kind of one unique thing that you may not have seen before um, if, you know, if, if you're new to building. The wing um, is pretty straightforward. You build it in five different panels. So there's a center panel, um, two inner panels, and two outer panels. And um, the stringers sort of cross over each other and, and glue on to uh, a spar, so to create the rigidity of the of the, of the airplane. And you know, I've, I've done loops with it, and I've done some pretty pretty you know interesting dives like a Stuka would do while flying it, and I haven't had any concerns about the, the wing structure itself. So. Um, and then the other weird thing with the, the Stuka is that all of the, um, the wing surfaces that are the, the control surfaces are actually fully flying. So they hang um, below and behind the trailing edge. And so for the flaps, I just used some um, basswood stringers to kind of create the, the hinges. But the um, ailerons, I used Dubro pin hinges at a 90 degree. So they go into the back trailing edge of the wing like, like you would normally see on a model, but then they bend 90 degrees down and go through the top um, leading edge of the aileron. And, I, and that was to try and create that, um, that, that scale look. And I wasn't sure if it was going to work at first, but I'm happy to report that it worked really, really well. And the airplane has pretty good authority in, in, in roles. So. Well, one possible advantage you had with the Stuka, and we talked about this before the show started, was uh, you didn't have to deal with either uh, retracts or gear that you would have to remove and, and belly land it. So did the, uh, I, I would think that the fixed gear made things a little easier. Did you have any challenges at all with the gear? No, I was actually quite happy with how they turned out. So um, similar to what I did on the Nate a few years back when we did fighter face off the Park Flyer series, um, there's a, a light ply keel that it's your main sort of center section of the, of the spat. And then you stack balsa wood on either side of it 
and then sand that to shape. And then embedded in the outermost balsa uh, panels are some light ply, which is where the axle goes through. Um, and, and one other kind of funny story was on either the second or the third flight of the model, I was flying it around and I was, of course, heading away from me versus towards me and I saw something fall off. I thought, oh, that's not good. <laughs> My initial thought was maybe the hatch came off, you know, stuff like that happens. As I, as I brought the airplane back around, I noticed that one of the wheels had actually dropped out of the, out of the spat. Um, what I had used was a 30 second piano wire, which is a simple L bend, which would go through. And then I used canopy glue to, to hold the, the, the tag, if you will, of the axle in place. Well, canopy glue apparently wasn't strong enough and it loosened up on one of the landings and that's what had happened. It had fallen out and the tire dropped off. And so I brought it in and I thought, well, I'll probably have to do some repairs after this because I, I land on take and take off on, on asphalt. But the model did just fine. It, it sort of skipped along a little bit and did a little bit of a ground loop, but no damage whatsoever. And believe it or not, even though that the tire is black and gray, which looks like everything else out uh, out in the field where I fly at, we're able to find it. And uh, it's, it's kind of neat because um, you know Pat mentioned you know 3D printing and for a spinner potential. This model does have that. Um, it's got a 3D printed spinner specifically for it. Um, it's got 3D printed um, wheels and rims. Uh, there's even a, a little bomb that if you want to add, um, you know, to dress the model up as well. All those are, are available um, through Rabbit Models. And he also offers um, a sort of a power pack for the models. So um, that's kind of a nice feature. And then, um, it, you know, obviously the plans are and the, the tissue templates are going to be free for download through uh, the online. Um, but you can also, um, if you want to get a short kit for the model, Monzano Laser Works will, uh, currently carries the model as well. So a lot of different options, and depending on how much you want to detail it up, um, you can get some some additional stuff for it. So what battery are you using um, to fly it? Uh, because it, it's powered by a 24-gram a, a, a brushless motor, 1,700 kV. I'm only using a two-cell 450 milliamp pack. And again, depending on that power usage, I can get about four to six minutes out of that. Nice. So I know we talked about the uh, tissue print templates in the past uh, with one of your other models, but for those that may not have seen it, kind of give us an overview a little bit about the process of, of making those and, and using those to cover the aircraft. Sure. So for the, uh, anytime I have to create the templates from scratch, um, what I use is the actual model itself. And I uh, use sort of tracing paper and I trace where the panel lines, I'm sorry, the, the panels would be. And usually I do it every other or every um, fuselage former. I import that into CAD, clean it up, and then usually have to do two or three different iterations of, you know, is, is the actual template itself going to fit right over the, over the model itself. It'd be a lot better if I if I designed in in 3D. I could just simply you know use a flattening program and, and have it already. But I do everything in 2D, kind of old school, so I have to, to manually do it. But once I've I've created the panels and I've added the colors and, and different logos and insignias, then what you do is um, you would take uh, I use 14 and a half or 14 inches by eight and a half uh, legal sheets, and I do a light coat of 3M or low tax spray on it, and then you just spread the, the tissue out on that piece of paper, and then you run it through your machine, through your printer, and it prints out on the tissue. So um, I print everything on white tissue. Uh, so all the color of this that you see there is, is, is printed, and it allows you know, really sharp um, panel lines. It, it allows you to have you know, emblems and insignias and all that stuff. You don't have to mask for it, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and I've been lately using um, a different kind of tissue. So you can use Japanese tissue or, you know, lightweight silk span. I've been using, um, it's called exam paper or exam table paper, excuse me. The same stuff like when you go to the doctor and they, you know, they roll it out on the table there and you sit on top of it. It's that same material and it works really, really well uh, because it, it, it holds the color um, opacity a lot better than standard tissue. Well, obviously, while you've been talking, we've watched it fly. Um, and in the video, you touched on a little bit, but is there anything further you want to talk a little bit any more about its flying uh, abilities or anything to look out for if you build one and fly one? 
flying, I, I would I would say it's probably you know you can be a newer pilot and 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 fly it if you've soloed um, you know an airplane or two. It, it really is a steady and uh, pretty forgiving airplane. Um, the stall, I, I put it in a pretty nasty position for the stall, and it just drops its nose, doesn't really drop a wing, and then you just apply power to get out of it. Um, you know, you can do basic maneuvers with it. Um, I've done loops, I've done rolls. Um, if you're going to do anything a little bit more aerobatic, you might need to increase your control throws. But um, you know, as a model, as you see right there, I don't, I don't use a gyro. Um, I don't have any um, dual rates or expo or anything like that in it. So it, it's the way that it's it's set so far as the controlled deflections and the article is pretty much how you're seeing it fly right there. The full scale, Stuka, I think you had mentioned, you know, if you want to take it into a dive, obviously they 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 dove on their targets and they had a dive siren. Um, and I can tell you that my grandfather was attacked by Stukas as a ground soldier. My grandfather landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day oh, and wow. he was attacked um, shortly after. It wasn't all right on the beach, but shortly after that, they were attacked by Stukas and uh you know, unfortunately, he died when I was about 12. So most of the stories, I didn't hear my father heard it. But he talked about how scary it was to hear that di those dive sirens as they dove and, and, and shot at the, the American troops and, and dropped bombs. And so um, I've heard, I, I've never heard one in a real Stuka, but I've, well, other than on video, but, you know, I can imagine um, that, uh, you know, that that would be quite scary. So if, if someone builds the model and, you know, wants to to make some dives with it, I mean, obviously it's it's robust enough that they don't have anything to worry about as long as they don't try to treat it like a 3D model, correct? Yeah, correct. And I would say if, you know, if you start adding a lot more to the model, you may want to replace some of the, um, the balsa stringers in the wing with basswood. Um, you're not going to add a lot of weight um, you know, with that transition, but you'll add a lot of strength. But, you know, the way that it's set up right now, the, the they sort of cross over and are glued into and butt up against the uh, the spar that's in it. So it, it's a pretty sturdy little model. Pat, did you have any thoughts about Derek's uh, Stuka or any questions for Derek? God, it looks great. <laughs> Thanks. Kind of, it's, it's not as fast as I expected it would be for a model that small. It, it really looks good. Yeah, and it, it, that's flying at probably about half to three quarters throttle, and it, it's it has enough, like it's light enough. It's only about eight and a half nine ounces, um, so that again has a pretty nice wing loading. So you don't have to fly at a thousand miles an hour. You can right, yeah, yeah, a little bit if you want to. So, well, that's part of the problem with the smaller airplanes. If they do get a little bit heavy and the wing loading comes up, they fly so much faster than scale speed. They just don't look right in the air. Yep. I agree. You know, and scale speed is kind of a odd thing. You know, over the years, we've talked about scale speed. And it's it's what it looks like. It's not what it actually is. You know, because if you take a six scale model that's supposed to fly at 230 miles an hour, you divide that by six. That's that's not very fast when you get right down to it. Yep. Well, you know, that's a great point because obviously in, in scale competition at the Nats next month here at AMA or any scale competition, that's the, obviously, as we know, you know, that's the goal is to try to perform um, scale like flight and only do things that were uh, possible. So, you, you know, you make a great point um, that uh, I think both models looked great in the air and, and didn't look like they were flying faster than they should be. They didn't look like they were jets. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Derek had mentioned, too, that uh, the wing in his airplane might possibly need to be beefed up a little bit for somebody who's going to add a little bit of weight or do snappier aerobatics. But uh, in the Hurricane, I used a vertical blade spar that's one piece that's um, reinforced with a 30-second plywood doubler out past the landing gear. And I don't know that you could break that wing. You know, it's, you'd really have to get nasty with it to, to make it come apart. Well, we got a comment from someone that knows a lot about scale competition, Brett Becker. Scale speed is certainly difficult to achieve, he says. Yeah, absolutely, particularly with a heavier loaded airplane. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. 
so in in the in the issue when when people get the chance to see the issue so we have the article that we shared about uh everything that went into the models and we have both of your construction articles then we have another article that um i wrote well i, I wrote the article about the about the models being built for the for the movie but i also wrote an article about collecting memorabilia around the movie um so i want to share that as well with people and this kind of was a test and i'm curious um i know um you're seeing it for the first time but uh, once we kind of look at it i'm curious your thoughts on this so i i'm friends with a gentleman who writes articles for doctor who magazine obviously you know everybody probably knows i'm a doctor who fan and they do issues sometimes where they talk about a certain year like 1965 for instance and he writes about all the collectibles that were available in 1965 and i thought you know we're talking about the movie the battle of britain and there's a lot of interesting things that are available that you could have purchased around the time that the film came out or even at the movie theater and so i thought it might be neat to share that so i wrote a two-page article about collecting memorabilia from the film and everything that you're seeing is from my personal collection. And I just kind of was curious, you know, to test the waters to see if that was something that readers would be interested in. So what we're looking at on the screen right now is on the left, uh, the book on the left under number one, that's a book about the making of the film that was published over 20 years ago. And thankfully it's being republished. And I originally was gonna get a copy of it to be in the issue, but the publisher pushed it back uh, a couple of months. And so I didn't want to hold up everything else. So the book should be out the end of this month. And it's basically a reprinting of that book. And there's an actual chapter uh, dedicated to the models. And there's some really interesting photos. And there's one really sad photo. And that is they were filming in Malta. And at the end of the filming with the models, they didn't want to pay to ship them back. So they burnt them. There's actually a bonfire photo, the last photo in the chapter about the models shows all the surviving models being burned in a bonfire. And what's really sad about that is right now there's a smaller model, not an RC model, but a smaller model that survived. And I think it's a 24 inch wingspan model. And it was basically, they were thrown out of the B-25. For the aerial shots, they used a B-25. And they made a few smaller models and they would throw them from the b-25 in flight and usually those were the ones that would crash into the water and they would film it from the b-25 one of those models survives and it's for sale on a prop website in england for twenty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> and this is not an rc model it's basically a free flight model so i imagine you know when i saw that picture of the remaining rc models being burned at the end of filming what that the, you know what those models might be worth if a free flight version from the film is worth twenty five thousand. So anyway, so the book on the left it tells you know a lot of details about the making of the movie and everything that went into it and some behind the scenes photos. So I would definitely recommend if people are interested in that to look for the new book that should be out on June thirtieth if it doesn't get pushed back because the book that's pictured is about a hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, on eBay or on some book sites because it's hard to get. And the new book will be, I think, $50 is the cover price. Uh, the book to the, the other book um, to the right is called A Narrow Margin. That book is very interesting because that's the book that the filmmakers use to, as kind of a basis for the film. And they used a lot of information in that book. So if the, you know, if the movie interests you, then that book is interesting to read because you know you know, basically that a lot of the information and a lot of the ideas came from that book. I believe that book was published in 1961. And at the time when they worked on the film, it was considered, you know, the best book about the Battle of Britain. Then under the picture O2 is a picture of Pilot Sergeant Andy Moore. And he's wearing, obviously, a um, RAF uniform, which I actually happen to own. So I bought a screen used uniform worn by him in the movie. Um, I'm not sure if it's that one that he's wearing in the picture, because I'm sure he probably had more than one. But the picture 03 is my uniform that he wore, Pilot Sergeant Andy Moore. And he's in the movie uh, um, 
from the very beginning. You see him in the opening sequence and you see him right at the end of the film um, at the airfield. So he's, he's in the entire movie and his name's Ian McShane, the actor. He's been in Pirates of the Caribbean and a lot of other movies. But I actually own his screen-worn uniform, as you can see there. I bought it from Planet Hollywood several years ago. And if you don't know what Planet Hollywood is, it basically was like their hard rock cafe for entertainment. And they would have restaurants all across the U.S. and they would have movie memorabilia. And sadly, for whatever reason, they began to close. And as they closed, they would send all the movie memorabilia back to Orlando, Florida, where they were headquartered. And they began to sell it because they just didn't have the room to store it all. And so I was lucky enough to be able to buy the uniform. And it actually comes with a letter basically uh, certifying its authenticity that it was worn by Ian McShane as Pilot Sergeant Andy Moore. And, you know, for you people that don't know, I mean, that's key for any kind of movie props or or wardrobe is, you know, to be able to show that, it, you know, it truly was worn and not just something that maybe was bought at a thrift store. So I'm really excited to own it. I have to say that I don't display it, though. And the reason that I don't display it is I had the idea that I would just buy an inexpensive mannequin and put it on the mannequin. And I was told by Michael Smith, our museum curator, that that was not a good idea, that I needed what they call a conservation form. So if you go to the Dayton Air Force Museum or, you know, any museum that uh, displays clothing, they use a conservation form that's made out of materials that won't damage anything that's being displayed on them. And so I thought, okay. So I went to the website he recommended and a conservation form for this uniform would be $700. And that's exactly how much I paid for the uniform. So um, as of yet, I haven't spent the money, but anyway, there's a, so that's an interesting thing that I talk about. Oh, uh, four, those are gum cards that you could buy in a pack with a obviously with a piece of chewing gum, just like baseball cards that came out at the time of the film. And there's 66 cards total. And so I'm I'm showing you some of the cards there. And then the second page of the article, a company called Dinky, uh, as you can see on the box, D-I-N-K-Y. They are very well known for die cast in Europe. And they came out with these two aircraft and they used the poster, as you can see on the boxes, they used the poster from the movie. The Stuka on the left, its special feature is it has a, a metal bomb underneath, and there's a little lever uh, that you can see in the picture um, on the side. And if you push the lever, the bomb drops, and the bomb takes one paper cap. You can put a cap in it, and when the metal bomb hits the ground, you know, obviously it makes a popping sound. So that was the special feature for the Stuka. The Spitfire special feature is that it has an electric motor, and if you flip the propeller, it'll continue to run until you stop it. So these were released at the time of the film, and they used the artwork from the film on the boxes. But about a year or two after the film came out, I don't know if the licensing was up at that point. So they continued to sell the models, but they were no longer in the uh, Battle of Britain boxes. So that's what I'm, I'm showing there. And then um, further down on that page, I, I'm showcasing... So on the bottom left, that was a, I guess, a bookazine or magazine that you could buy in the movie theater when the Battle of Britain movie came out. And it actually has an intro by Lord Doubting, who basically commanded the RAF during the Battle of Britain. He actually wrote for this in the, in the front part, and it has a lot of pictures of the making of the movie and stories about making the film. And the picture that was on the first page of Pilot Sergeant Andy Moore in, in the uniform, that came from this book uh, or magazine that you could buy in theaters. And then lastly, I'm showing the uh, two different DVD releases that I'm aware of. And they're vastly different in that the one on the left actually comes with two discs. So you get the film on the first disc, and then the second disc has a bunch of special features that has interviews with cast, and they have an inter interview with an actual um, Battle of Britain pilot uh, for the RAF. Um, not so on the DVD on the right. It only comes with one disc and there's no special features. So if anyone's interested in purchasing a DVD copy, I would highly recommend the version on the left because the interviews are very interesting and they do talk about the models in the special features because obviously they came out much after the film. Uh, so they do talk about that and they talk about some of the things that wouldn't be allowed today 
um, uh, such as how low the aircraft flew, the full-scale aircraft. Um, they talk about a, an instance where one of the film crew had to dive on the ground because one of the full-scale aircraft was going to take his hat off. That's how low they were flying. And that one of the actual explosions they blow up an actual hangar on the on the base where the movie is filmed and it's true where the uh suzanne york is running to a to like a bunker and they blow it up and that's it's not cut it's live so they blow up this building really close to suzanne york who's in the film and some other actors and actresses and it's all live and you know it's so it talks about in the special features that they don't think it would be allowed today the type of flying that was done for the film with full scale and the explosions. So it's really interesting. So if you're interested in, in a DVD, I would highly recommend getting the one on the left. So I'm kind of curious to hear from, from you, Pat, and from you, Derek. I mean, do you find that interesting? I mean, it was just kind of a test for me to kind of give a little more information around the film. So I'm just curious from your perspectives, you know, when you read the magazine, whether it be digital or print or seeing what's on screen right now, does that interest you? to learn a little bit more about what was available and collectibles around the film? Yes, it definitely does. I'd, I'd love to see the, the uh, disc on the making of the film. And cause you know, nowadays most everything's animated by computer. So right. you, you, you don't know what's real and what's not, but uh, yeah, to be able to do that kind of thing is it definitely adds to the authenticity. And I think, um, you know, I, I, my area of interest, and I think, Pat, yours seem to be the same, is, is a lot of scale, like, you know, the history of the model, the history of the aircraft, you know, that sort of thing, and, and being able to sort of connect it in a way with real life tangible things that, you know, that were around um, during the time of the model that you're, you're doing. I, I think it's very interesting, you know, the history and, and the hobby, you know, those two do go hand in hand quite often. Mm hmm absolutely and uh the, you know there was a little bit of talk about the blue max and uh as far as it, and they they talk about it in the special features you know that film which you know is great and some of the other films and um that they you know when they set out to do the battle of britain they didn't they only wanted to use full scale but that wasn't available with the stuka and and i used some quotes in the article that i pulled from the special features that came from the producer of the film and then the gentleman who um you know was in charge of all the aerial um photography and videography and they tell some really interesting stories like uh you know i don't want to give it all the way i hope people will get it and watch it but like how long it took to get all the airplanes airborne so you know the camera b25 would usually take off first and then you know the uh the different full-scale aircraft like the the stukas and whatnot would take off and then they would all circle so they would keep all this the the hurricanes and stukas together and they would keep all the german aircraft together and they would circle because more and more would take off and then by the time they got them all up there the filming time was short because then they had to queue them all to land so the takeoff and and gathering and the landing took more of their flight time than the actual filming and the other thing that was really interesting is that at first none of the full-scale aircraft wanted to come very close to the b-25 you know out of safety and the the people behind the cameras were saying you know they're too far out we can't it's hard to d discern what is you know what's a german what which one's the german aircraft which one's you know the british aircraft so they they had a meeting and they said you know you're gonna have to bring it in closer and what's interesting is the b25 was painted in very bright colors it wasn't painted like a you know a world war ii b25 they purposely painted it in very bright colors so that it would be easily seen and so when they filmed the model or filmed the full scale, they were having them fly very, very close to the B-25. And uh, so that's how we get such great aerial videography. Um, and the other thing they talked about was that when the, the scene, when the full scale aircraft come over to bomb London, that it took a lot of permissions to make that happen because firstly, not everybody necessarily may have been thrilled about World War II at, you know, at that point in time, about World War II German aircraft and, and German markings flying over London. 
And secondly, these are old aircraft that they took from museums. Some of these were static aircraft in front of museums and they worked on them and got them flying. So, you know, they had a whole crew working on the aircraft, but there was always a concern, you know, what if there's an engine problem or what if this? So there was, it talks about in special features, all the, the hoops they had to go through to film that scene with the aircraft flying over London to get the permissions uh, to make that happen and, and, you know, making sure that it was safe. So, I mean, I think when we watch the film, you know, you don't realize just with any film, you know, everything that goes into it and, and how much uh, the producers and the aerial unit and everybody had to do. And I, I think it's really neat that, that, that is, that film is considered is it's believed to be the first film that ever used RC models. And so to me that, you know, beyond, being interested in aviation, that ties it directly into our hobby. So that's another reason why I wanted to, to share the story. So, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about this issue. I mean, I obviously love every issue that we put out, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to have authored that article and to be been able to work with Dave Platt and to, to work with you both and, and give people, our readers, give our readers free plans. So hopefully they'll want to build these models and, you know, obviously, if they want to, you know, purchase the plans or they want to purchase a short kit, uh, you know, that's available to them. And, you know, we've got the plan sale that's coming up really soon every year for the October issue. We do a plan sale and that takes place from the middle of September through the end of October. So, you know, obviously feel free to if you if you don't want to just download the plans, you know, obviously feel free to purchase the plans from our plan service. Um, if you're not in a rush to build either airplane, you can certainly wait until our uh, our planned sale in um, mid-september and october uh, so you know we've we've almost taken the whole hour but i i kind of want to open the conversation back up to both of you um pat and derek and if is there anything else that you want to talk about the movie or the models that you designed or anything we haven't touched on that you want to you want to share pat i'll let you go first well, I appreciate that. And I do very much appreciate the opportunity to be able to be involved in this little project that you've got going here. And um, to tell you the truth, I was kind of shocked when I got the email asking me to participate in it. And I, I like I said before, I very much appreciate that. And, uh, you know, anything we can do to further modeling or model aviation or any aspect of RC free flight view control or or virtually any other aspect of the hobby. You know, that's that's my main goal is to keep the hobby going just as long as we possibly can. Absolutely. Uh, see, I don't think I can say it any better than that, Pat. It was such an honor to be able to, you know, ask to be part of this and working alongside with you, creating the project for the, the, the two airplanes and the, and the article is really exciting. and. Um, one other thing, I think you'd mentioned this in your last month's video, Jay, but this is your 15th year um, in, as editor. So I wanted to give you a big congratulations on your work anniversary. So, Yes, thank you. It's true. This, uh, this month is my 15th anniversary with AMA, and I started on June 30th. So in about, I guess, two weeks from today, it'll be 15 years. And, you know, it's interesting that when we compiled the article that just recently ran about the history of Model Aviation Magazine, which goes back to 1936, we found out that I'm the longest editor continuous. There was a, a, a situation where we had an editor for a while and they came back, but continuous service, I'm the longest editor in the history of a magazine that started in 1936. And it's just an unbelievable honor for me. And I think most people probably know, but my father owned a hobby shop when I was a kid growing up. And so I've been involved in hobbies, you know, since a very young age. And it did model model airplanes and cars and boats and rockets and plastic models and you know everything really, and um, you know it, it's it's just been amazing to be able to work for AMA and support the hobby that I love and and get to know so many great people and go to trade shows and flying events and you know so it's it's certainly a passion like it is for all of us and um, I moved from Florida to to work at AMA here in Indiana and. A lot of people to this day think that that's crazy, you know, that, you know, why would you, you know, Florida, you got beaches. Why would you move from Florida? And I said, yeah, but I got to, to, you know, to do a job I love. And, you know, they say that if you do a job you love, you don't work a day in your life. I don't know if I go quite that far. I mean, it is a, a lot of work to, to put out a 124 plus page magazine every month, but I love it. And I, I love um, 
working with everybody and meeting everybody. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear comments and positive comments about the magazine. And, you know, my father's a member and my flying friends in Florida uh, that I go and visit are members. And, you know, so I want to put out the best magazine possible and and do everything possible to as pat said you know to protect this hobby and and have it um last for generation after generation so yes very excited and honored to to be at ama for 15 years and i also want to touch on really quick that there's a lot of great things going on right now we we have camp ama going on at ama right this very moment and uh next week is the national fun fly uh, friday saturday and sunday Next month is the 100th anniversary uh, for the Nats. So that's extremely exciting. Um, you know, we've got a helicopter world championships in August, and we'll have teams coming from outside of the country. So obviously, you know, every year there's, a, there's amazing events across the country, um, but we've got some really great stuff happening at AMA that I hope people will be able to participate in. But if you can't, especially with the Nats, keep in mind that we have Nats News which is a daily newsletter that's available online for everyone to, to participate in. And uh, obviously we're going to have articles in the magazine of a lot of these events. Uh, so be sure to, uh, to, to check those things out. And also, as I always do, I want to remind people that our next show is July 21st and that will be during the Nats. So who knows, maybe there'll be an opportunity to go live from the Nats or talk to some competitors. Um, I always, I always find it really nice to uh, to be able to attend the Nats because every three or four days a different um, SIG comes in or a different, you know, so I might be meeting and talking with people that are doing free flight. And then maybe four days later, I'm talking to people that are flying RC combat and then I'm talking to soaring. And so it's, it's always neat to see that. And I remember 15 years ago when I started, the first two years that I worked at AMA, I wrote the article about the Nats and I spent a half a day every day for I think 30 days straight, I only, there was only one day off. I worked a half day every day for 30 days straight, or maybe it was even five weeks, but I loved it, you know, just to see it. And so I would urge anyone, even if you don't participate, to come to the Nats because there's so much to be learned by um, the subject matter experts that are there. So I won't belabor it any more than that, but I just wanted to share a little bit about what's going on at AMA and a lot of great events that I hope people will be able to attend. And, you know, I, I thank you both for uh, working with us on this and uh, on this project. And and Derek, uh, I think, you know, it's okay if it's okay with me, if it's okay with you to give a sneak peek that you're going to have another uh, construction article in our build issue, October issue. So please tell the, tell the viewers a little bit about your next project. Oh, sure. So I think it's, yeah, this shoulder over here, you can see I've got a, a P38 um, it's an earlier version, so it's an F version. It's got the more streamlined um, intakes. But this one is another park flyer. It's going to be 40 inches because it's a twin. Um, it's going to have the same power setup as the Stuka. So this has two of those 24-gram uh, motors. And then one thing that's sort of unique about this airplane is um, it does have retracts, but they're not what I would call commercial electric retracts. I've um, used metal-geared 9-gram servos with um, the actual strut of the, the landing gear uh, mounted with easy connectors. And so what it, that allows you to do is using settings on your, um, on your transmitter, you can go more or less than 90 degrees, which is what most standard units do. And it's about half to a third the weight of what the smallest standard unit I can do. So it's kind of neat. The model will, will, will have that, and then the design will also include if you want to have thick gear or plugging gear or just a belly flopper if you want to do that too. But yeah, I've been working on that, that cleaning up that design. Um, the model has flown, flies um, really, really well for, for a twin. So I'm excited to, to get that one to you as well. Yeah, and you even uh, put that on the back burner temporarily so that you could work on the Stuka project, and I, I really appreciate that, but we're excited about the P-38 and our social media manager, Lee Ray, that's his favorite airplane, the P-38. So we're going to have to convince him he needs to build one and, and sure. showcase, showcase that on, on social media. So, well, again, thank you both. And I, I hope that everyone that reads the magazine reaches out and shares their thoughts uh, if they enjoyed the articles. And definitely let me know if the article about uh, collectibles around the movie is of interest. And I look forward to seeing everybody again on July 21st. So 
Thanks and see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Absolutely.